Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all well. And today I'm going to be discussing another Eurovision topic, something which I think is important to talk about. And it's my own country at Eurovision. And what's next for them? The United Kingdom after placing second in this year's Eurovision Song Contest. So I thought it was important to talk about this because it feels like we're at a turning point now. And it's kind of a pivotal moment because next year we can either continue this good result streak or we might revert to old ways so I just want to discuss based on kind of historical evidence and just a little bit of reading what the media has to say about all this to summarize what I think is going to happen and what I think should hopefully happen that kind of thing so of course let me know down below what all of you guys think I'm always excited to read your comments and thoughts on this subject and consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already. Stay tuned, I'll be back a few more times about Eurovision this year, but I also want to kind of divert into more just talking about music in general, because that is one of my major passions in life. So yeah, let's get straight into this. So three years ago in 2019, I made a kind of random video on my channel. It was my first Eurovision themed video where I talked about the UK at Eurovision and how I thought they could improve slash win from 2020 onwards. What I wanted to do in that video is just talk about my frustrations in that case because we came last that year in 2019 and I felt like we were just on this kind of streak of really really bad results and I finally wanted to show my face on YouTube in the Eurovision circle because I hadn't done that before. I was really nervous and you could probably tell my I wasn't very um good at interacting with the camera and I was a bit camera shy back then as well. I've improved quite a bit. I felt kind of frustrated at our results and I wanted to talk about that. So you can check out that video if you want as well. But three years later, I'm back now because it seems that we turned a corner and I want to just sort of make a little summary of everything that's gone on and let's see what we can do in the future, basically. So obviously Sam Ryder came second place, which was a really pleasant surprise. I wasn't expecting it. If you've seen my prediction videos, my initial reaction, I wasn't expecting us to come that high up. So it was really quite a pleasant surprise. I've suffered from this kind of negativity when thinking about the UK at Eurovision, kind of thinking we never have a shot. Because of kind of all the negative energy we have in this country around the subject anyway, I don't kind of like to think it's diffused into me, but it did. And I'm trying to work on that as well in future videos when it comes to talking about my own country. It's been quite a success in this country. The song Spaceman, it's charted at number two. It seems as if there's this sort of positivity around the subject as well. I think Sam has been a great ambassador. And also he was invited to perform at the Queen's Jubilee concert, which was, you know, really nice. It was the only reason I switched that thing on in the first place because I'm not really a royalist or anything. So I just, felt like that was really nice to have kind of the likes of all these big artists. You had Brian May, you had Elton John, and then Sam Ryder was amongst them. And that, that felt really nice to see. It feels like Eurovision is sort of back on the map here in the UK after I was finishing in second place. So, you know, that's really nice to see. It's really positive. So before talking about what is coming up next for the UK, what I think we should do, I want to kind of have a look back at the last sort of 20-ish years to see this sort of trend that we've had and whether we might keep following this trend, if you get me. Let's start off by talking about the 90s. Obviously we won in 1997 with Katrina and the Waves, Love Shine Light. That's still our best result since, it's been 25 years. And we still bring her out every year to do a little performance or talk about Eurovision. And I think she's getting a bit fed up with it now because obviously she has been doing this for 25 years and it would be nice to have someone else, which I think Sam could be the replacement eventually um, as a sort of Eurovision figurehead in the UK. But we did have a good run in the 90s and I think people bought, sold, listened to, consumed, all of our entries then as well. It was sort of amongst the charts. It was in CDs. I've even got my um, my Nell 43 from 1999. And you can see the original price we paid for it was 16.99, which is absolutely atrocious. You can think about like commodities like this that are absolutely worthless now. You can probably get them for one pound on eBay. Um, but yeah, on the back, you can see here, precious 
with Say It Again at 15. And this CD has got some absolute bangers on it. You've got Fats and Small Turnaround. You've got Basement Jacks with Red Alert. You've got Blur with Coffee and TV. So many great songs on here. Chemical Brothers, Hey Boy, Hey Girl, just absolute throwbacks. But the Eurovision entry for us is amongst all these tunes. So it was kind of in, a, in, in the circle of the charts, just it was in the pop sphere in the UK. And then it all just fell apart after Precious, I think. Precious was one of our kind of worst results in the 90s, but it still wasn't a disgrace. And it was still included on, on CDs like this. But then we hit the year 2000 and I believe this is when everything changed, when everything started to go downhill. So in the year 2000, we had Nikki French with Don't Play That Song Again. We finished 16th, which was historically our worst result ever at Eurovision, I believe. And the song isn't terrible. It's very kind of camp ABBA slash steps. It's like an offshoot of steps. That's how I see it. And it was very much of its time. It's definitely dated now. I think our problem was the styling, the colour scheme, everything we had on stage didn't work. I was shocked to find out that Nikki French was 35 when she did that performance because the way they styled her, hairstyle, costume, that kind of purplish overcoat thing, it aged her quite badly, I think. And that's not kind of, I'm not trying to be rude or, or, or mean or critical of, of her at all. I just think the way that we approached it that year, we didn't get the styling right, we didn't get the choreography right, it all kind of looked even dated for 2000. And then we just continued this trend. So we had Lindsay Dracus next year, No Dream Impossible, we came 15th, which is not amazing. It's still kind of mid table. Again, it wasn't kind of to the heights of the 90s. And that song is probably one of the strangest compositions I've heard of ours at Eurovision. It just sort of a, a mishmash of early 2000s Euro trance and this kind of classical chord progression. And that's the kind of thing I would have enjoyed, but I think it was executed quite badly and it just seemed like a kind of overall mishmash of, of strangeness. And then we shot back up. We came third in 2002, Jessica Garlic with Come Back. A pretty decent ballad. It's got a nice hook, a nice melody. But I think that year in general was quite a weak year. So this song wouldn't have been as high if it was in maybe 2001, 2004, five. I think it, it wouldn't have kind of been up there. It's just the, the case of a weak year. But this is a point I'm going to come back to later because we were third in 2002 and then we came absolutely dead last with Gemini in 2003, Cry Baby. It's the infamous song for the UK. People still talk about it almost 20 years later because of how flat and out of tune the performance was, the way that the media tried to kind of blame it on our involvement in the Iraq war that year that we came last when actually if you listen to the performance it was just really dreadful it really really quite dreadful like I make this joke that Gemini were one of the first acts to um portray bitonality on stage which is a musical compositional technique from the 20th century and kind of modern com compositions it's a way like I kind of like joke about how if somebody is singing out of tune to the track, I just call it bitonal, which basically means there's two different keys going on at the same time. Um, and also North Macedonia 2000 is another one where they just started singing in a different key to the actual backing track, which is quite funny. So yeah, we came dead last that year. It was a complete drop from the year before. And then we just continued these bad results. 2004, James Fox with Hold On To My Love, we came 16th. Javine with Touch My Fire, we came 22nd really disappointing results, just not good enough efforts. There's Samson with Teenage Life, which is probably my least favourite song next to 2010 from the UK. We came 19th. That was an absolute embarrassment to the nation in my eyes. I know some people like that song. Yeah, it's not good at all. I, I still cringe, you know, 16 years later about that entry. And then we had Scooch in 2007, Flying the Flag for You. We managed to actually chart in our top 10 which is so strange. I, I still to this day don't understand. It's just a total piss take of the competition. And it was one of our lowest points of the 2000s. And then we had Andy Abraham in 2008 with Even If. We came 25th dead last for the second time in that decade, which is really bad because Andy Abraham is quite a good vocalist. He's got some nice other songs, but in the end of the colour scheme, 
the cheesiness of it all just didn't resonate with the European public. And then in 2009, we changed it all. We changed the game because we brought Andrew Lloyd Webber, who is a renowned composer in the musical theatre scene in the UK. He's quite famous. He's, I think he has a knighthood as well. Um, and we brought him in to collaborate with a chosen artist who then went on to join the Sugar Babes, Jade Ewan. And we came fifth that year. We actually put in a bit of effort. We did a bit of promotion and the song was very classic. It was very British. It felt kind of very authentic. And I think it resonated, especially with the juries that year. And we did really well. We did ourselves proud, fifth place, really good. And then the next year we jumped straight back down to last with Josh Dibbervy. That sounds good to me. It was a kind of, how I see it, a case of the songwriters being chosen because of their back catalogue. Obviously Stock Aitken and Waterman are very well known for their 80s compositions with Kylie Minogue, with Rick Astley, with Dead or Alive, stuff like that. You know, they have a signature sound, which was no longer cool or fashionable in 2010. And they wrote this song, which just tanked completely. The staging didn't work. The backing singers didn't work. I've already made a video about this, but it's one of our worst efforts ever in my eyes. And it was just such a shame again to jump down from fifth place all the way down to last in the space of a year, just like 2002 to 2003. I think it was totally embarrassing and yeah, I hope we never go back to that position again. And then we continue to do relatively badly across the 2010s, apart from with Blue in 2011. Everything else was coasting very, very close to the bottom and we just weren't putting enough effort in. 2019, we came last with Michael Rice, Bigger Than Us. And then in 2021, we also came last with zero points with James Newman. So everything felt like a total decline from the year 2000 across two decades and I think we finally had a change of heart from the BBC in 2022 because I think it was just getting too much to be one of the best music industries in the world entering a global music contest which is one of the most viewed contests ever in the year and just constantly doing really badly. We were showing ourselves up and we should be out there putting fresh talent and good songs and songs that actually reflect our music industry. And I think that's actually what we did this year. It paid off. I think what we did right this year, which is something we kind of did in 2009, was we had a lot of promotion. And the promotion, I think, helped us get that really good score in the end, because people were streaming this song from all corners of Europe, all corners of the world. It was being kind of, coupled with Sam's personality as well. I think his his presence in interviews, he, he won over the press in lots of different countries. And I think that really helped us. The general positivity he brought to the table, taking back that narrative of us coming last because everyone hates us when it's, it's totally not true. It's because we weren't putting enough effort in. It's because we weren't actually listening to the competition and learning from it, listening to what does well at Eurovision and not just having our own sort of perception of, oh, this is a Eurovision song. This is what we should be sending. This is what wins. When in that case, it wasn't. We were just kind of taking this generalized stereotype of a Eurovision song and just entering it. Love, peace, that kind of thing. It was even made fun of in the 2016 Interval Act. You know, it was a total stereotype. We took back the narrative and we let Sam have full creative control over the song. He wrote the song with Amy Wadge. He basically had all the staging ideas. And we didn't, We, I think what they got right is that he probably didn't let anyone come in and sort of suggest silliness. He said like, I want to do it this way and it worked. It didn't look bad. The staging wasn't gimmicky. It came across really well. That guitar solo at the end that they added in put, totally brought it to a whole new level. I thought they kind of added a bit of a spark into the ending of the song. They did a good job reducing it down to the three minute threshold as well. So it's clear that tap management are invested in our acts. They're invested in the whole process and they actually want to do win because it will make them look better too. It will possibly get them more clients. So yeah, I think we should keep it going with tap management. I was skeptical at first because I thought, oh, you know, they're focusing on getting the right artist, but maybe not the right song. I was won over in the end. 
and I think we should definitely keep in listening tab and basically using their resources and their ability to find a good artist. So now let's move on to the media response because I think this is really important in the UK. It's top down, like I said in the previous video. When the media sets the tone at the top, it filters right down to the general public. And this is the problem we've had for years in the UK. We've had media bashing the contest, laughing at it, taking the piss, and basically branding it as this sort of kitsch, silly event once a year. No one takes it seriously. And then no one takes it seriously in the UK apart from the fans. And I think the, some papers took a more positive stance this year. They changed the narrative. They sort of apologized for their previous criticisms. They kind of took back what they said in the past and said, actually, maybe we weren't doing so well, not because of Brexit, not because of politics, but because of our effort and our attitude. And I think people genuinely appreciated that here, especially the fans. People watched the competition this year because they were reading that we actually might have a shot. And then we got pleasantly surprised that we came second, you know? I think that that was nice. It was more promotion, positive energy. It was really good. But there was a couple of papers who had some interesting takes, which I want to go through because I think these little bits and pieces of journalism are still putting a bit of a drag on the attitude here and I don't like it at all. So of course we've got the Daily Express who don't do their research clearly because they wrote the last win the UK saw was in 1997 with the song Love Shine a Light by Christina and the Waves. So that's all I have to say about that. And then we've got the um, Guardian. So the Guardian put out an article as well, clearly also didn't do their research. So a journalist called Zoe Williams put out an article called The Days of Null Points Are Over. Plucky Little Britain has cornered the Eurovision sympathy vote. So I genuinely don't want to read this article unless I get into character. So that's what I'm going to do. Ooh. Hello, darling. Oh, no, 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 I didn't watch Eurovision. No, 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 I was tending to my uh, sourdough starter, you see. Yes, I was hoping to make avocado on toast tomorrow for breakfast. Oh, we came second last, did we? Oh, second place. Oh, what, you want me to write an article? Uh, I didn't watch it though. I'll, I'll just uh, be yes for it, it's fine. Okay, bye. Okay, no, just kidding. This was actually a sympathy vote. <laughs> Having observed over a number of years, our neighbours near and far have concluded that nobody suffers more at the hands of obnoxious political class than we, their own tuneful people. Pity would never get us to number one. Justice will always win out, but it can put us at least at a credible second. So this journalist had the gumption basically to declare that our points this year were purely sympathy votes because people in Europe felt sorry for our political class system which makes absolutely no sense to me. Why would a 14 year old girl in Bulgaria pick up the phone and vote for us after looking at Sam Ryder's performance because she felt sorry about the cost of living crisis here? Look, I don't think that's what happened. People don't think about that when they vote. They think, oh, this is a good song. I'm voting for it. I like this song. I'm going to download it. Oh, I like this artist. I think they're cool. Like, <laughs> seriously, this is the kind of thing that makes me like, want to pull my hair out in rage because it's newspapers like this which are supposed to be sort of our good newspapers or newspapers that don't BS it and they totally did BS it. They totally did and oh it was one of the few newspapers that actually took this strange narrative and didn't want to kind of go back on what they said and apologise. They wanted to keep this really strange take and yeah I've got zero respect. <laughs> But overall, there was a slight shift in the media. I think that did have a good impression on the UK public. I think there was just a general good positive vibe, excluding the two examples I showed you. Um, so what's next? That's the key question. What should we do to continue this good streak of results? Because like I've shown you guys, we've done well and then we've come last the next year, okay? 
So let's hope that doesn't happen next year. I think we can avoid that situation if we keep tap management because clearly they know what they're doing and I think they've got a goal in mind to eventually get us a win. So let's keep them, keep the positivity and give the artists full creative control over what they want, the image, the sound, that kind of thing. Because when you get somebody throwing their two cents in there who doesn't know what they're talking about, you result in two giant trumpets hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, I think also something that's come out of this is good press means bigger names might come forward next year. I'd like to see an established name represent us, maybe somebody that's quite well known in the UK, but not so well known outside of the UK, because I think that's what other countries tend to have at Eurovision. They have an artist that's relatively famous in their own country and maybe in the neighbouring countries, but not necessarily outside of sort of that kind of corner of where they're from in Europe. So yeah, we'll see what happens next year. I'm excited to see if we get any nice um, rumoured acts coming forward but what not to do let's not revert to our old ways let's not go back to what we were doing before in writing songs that sort of people think sound like a Eurovision song when it's clearly not something that's competitive or is going to push for the win we need to write songs that people would want to have on their CD would want to have as, as a lead single not something that they're kind of embarrassed about or it's just a little bit of fun for Eurovision but they're not taking it too seriously I think that's the only way we can go about it to kind of keep up this good results but of course let me know down below what you guys think and stay tuned I'll be back soon for more content and I hope you have a good rest of the weekend bye